Yep. Grace Girl. Also go to answeringislamblog.wordpress.com because that's a response to Osama or Zawadi, but I have other articles as well that are not necessary responses. Okay, folks, welcome. <clears throat> may the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, may the Lord Jesus beatify us, beatify me, sanctify us, sanctify me by his Spirit, wash us in the holy blood of Jesus Christ, and fill us for the glory of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, we love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Crucify our flesh, destroy our flesh, and fill us with fruit from the Spirit, life from the Spirit, power from the Spirit, love from the Spirit, to love you perfectly and to love one another and cover us by the blood of Jesus Christ. Wash us in the blood of Jesus. Purify us in the holy blood of Jesus Christ, the Father's Son. <clears throat> the Father's heart become flesh. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants and fill me with knowledge and wisdom and power and insight from your spirit and fill them with wisdom and knowledge from your Holy Spirit. Clothe us by your spirit. Seal us by your spirit. And Father, I ask that you do that for our loved ones. My two angels, your gifts to me, seal them by the Spirit, cover them with the blood of Jesus and save them, save us. And Father, enable me to recall scriptures correctly and interpret them <clears throat> perfectly. And then give us the power to live out your word perfectly and to love your word perfectly and proclaim your word perfectly. Live it out for the glory of Jesus and even be willing to die for your word. Your voice, the Holy Scriptures. Save us from attacks of the enemy. And purify my motives, sanctify my, my heart for the glory of Jesus. Do it for the glory of Jesus, not the praise of men. And save us from attacks of the children of Satan. Surround us with a wall of fire from your Holy Spirit, Father. We need you desperately. And please save us from our flesh, the stains of our flesh, Father. We need you. We love you. We need the Lord Jesus. We love your Son. We need your Spirit. We are in love with your Spirit. Have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. Yahovah. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Yahovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Yahovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I pray the Lord Jesus will anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to your ears and beatify me to just rate it with the beauty of Jesus. So I won't be <clears throat> a stumbling block to anyone, right? Guys, I tried to live stream yesterday. I wasn't able to, right? The reason why I wasn't able to is because I didn't have a place to live stream. Again, this is how it's going to be until I get my own place. So pray that by December, near the end of December, I can find a place here that I can afford, my brother and I, and that the Lord Jesus will plant me secure, securely in this place and that I don't go anywhere and give me favor locally in Jesus' name and provide abundantly through me for my children because I know by faith they will come to me. By faith they will come in Jesus' name and I can raise them up in the love of Christ. I just have to endure and be patient and trust in the Lord. Pray for my miracle November 20th, that I will be granted favor, that I can be at peace here, because in Jesus' name, I don't return to Chicago. Maybe visit, but never go back there, at least not for now. So, guys, can you join me and pray, especially for Wednesday, for something miraculous? Because I'll be honest, everything I've prayed for the last two years, I've gotten the opposite, and I've been hammered. And yet I know that the Holy Spirit will seal me and secure me in the love of Jesus and never let me turn away. Amen? All right. Everyone with me? Now, <clears throat> no, why would I need to move near to David Wood? Eugenio, I just told you I'm already planted where I'm at. Why would you want me to leave? All right? I don't get it. And this is where they accepted me. And as I'm live streaming on my YouTube channel, I'm also broadcasting it live for Pal Talk. If you guys want to listen in on Pal Talk as well, it's in the room called Christian Dialogue 08. I don't know if it's in the social issues or is it in the Christianity section of Pal Talk. So they're listening to me on Pal Talk. One of the admins is Child of God. Child of God is the precious brother in Jesus Christ who's allowing me to use his, his home, his internet, his office. So pray for him and his family. Pray for my brothers, my siblings, my sisters, their children. Pray for an anointing from the Spirit and a blessing from the Spirit that God will bless this brother who is serving me and going above and beyond what he needs to out of his love for Jesus Christ. This is actually his room. The internet here is perfect, much better than in my brother's house. 
right? So praise the Lord for him. And I'm broadcasting live in his room on Peltalk, Christian Dialogue 08 in the Social Issues Human Rights section. So they're listening here too. So you guys on Peltalk, invite more people, you know, and if you have questions, let me know. Okay. Okay, Rob Christian is telling me, say hello to my friends in Peltalk. So for you guys on Peltalk, Rob Christian, who sold you out for YouTube, says hi. We've all sold you out for YouTube because YouTube is the place to be. As well as Discord, Protestant Believer is giving you guys a shout out. Grace Girl Protestant Believer says hi, everyone else. And he's now broadcasting on Discord. God bless you wherever you're listening at. And those who listen in the upcoming days, the Lord Jesus bless you and use my meager efforts to bless you for the glory of Jesus. All right. Praise God. Again, thank the Lord for Protestant Believer being able to join us at last minute notice. Last minute, folks. I gave him less than 10 minutes to be, to be pre prepared. Even first last, God bless you, brother. First last has a prayer request. Let's pray for this, brother. Pray in your hearts. Pray at home. And maybe before I... End the session. We'll lift them up. Remind me to do so. First, last prayer request. He has an uncle who had a stroke back home today. Okay. His uncle has had a stroke. Please pray for him because he's not saved. He is very unhealthy and extremely overweight and has many health issues. Please pray for him in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. We plead the stripes of Jesus Christ upon your uncle. We, we plead and pray and beseech Lord Jesus for the healing power that flows from his stripes, from his wounds, because by his wounds we are healed spiritually, emotionally, and physically. May the Lord Jesus grant them the healthy needs to come to know Jesus and trust in Jesus, be saved and covered by the blood of Jesus, born of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, we come in agreement for first and last uncle in Jesus' name. Please, Lord Jesus, you desire none to perish. Folks, pray for me. Today is one of my cheat days, and I ate kind of too much. Pray that I don't have many of these cheat days, but I can get strict on my diet to get my health back for the glory of Jesus if he wants me to be around. Whew. Anyway, are you guys ready to do part two? I have a lot of part twos that I need to catch up on. <clears throat> right. You better run for the batter, a, a border, Alex Geskin. Get, te quiero Taco Bell. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, pray I don't gain that weight, that in Jesus' name, that I've lost that weight, and I'll keep it off and lose more. Please, Lord, for that favor. I don't want to be a bondage to my flesh anymore. It was disgusting. Pray he gives me perfect victory over my flesh, over gluttony, over sin, to walk in the life of the Spirit. Okay, I have no idea who is he talking to. Okay, if we're ready to begin, hopefully we'll get near 200, as we often do. By the grace of Jesus Christ, even though the last minute. You guys understand what I'm doing, right? I'm doing a part two of what I began two days ago. And there are other shows that I need to do follow-ups to. The Synoptic Gospels and the Deity of Jesus Christ. I need to finish that. My series on Jesus clearly being identified as the creator of all angelic creatures. And therefore, he cannot be the Archangel Michael and a host of other things that I need to finish, and new things I need to begin. Siren, I heard you're dropping weight from your chin to your belly. In Jesus' name, will we all lose that weight and keep it off. Samoe, don't be a hater, Samoe. I'll get my muscle back because I have muscle memory. Just because I lost a lot of weight and I need to build muscle, don't hate, friend. It's not about all muscles, friend. I know you're a hater, but we'll forgive you. Here we go. Hater Wood with the Hater Aid. This guy invented Hater Aid. I mean, when you talk about haters, this man is the Mac, he's the Bruce Lee of haters. Drop the Hater Aid, Whitey. See, this is the white man for you. Drop the Hater Aid, Whitey. Don't hate the player, hate the game. Don't hate participate. All right. Anyway. Everyone ready? My coffee stained teeth. Okay. Andrew, you're here? Andrew Martin? 
Hopefully they'll start coming in. Let's continue where we left off. Let's continue where we left off. Remember, we left off. Say, Christian, that's grounds for a block. We left off briefly discussing Isaiah 52, verse 13, in re reference to whose glory did Isaiah see? Whose glory did Isaiah write about by inspiration of the Holy Spirit? Right? Whose glory did Isaiah see? Whose glory did Isaiah write about by inspiration of the Holy Spirit? If you don't know what I'm talking about, make sure to listen to the last session that I did two days ago. We went pretty in-depth on the God that Isaiah saw in his temple vision in Isaiah 6, right? <clears throat> and the arm of Jehovah that Isaiah said would be revealed, manifested to the ends of the earth. And from the New Testament perspective, we clearly saw. Let me refresh your memories by the power of the Holy Spirit as the Spirit guides me to speak the truth without error for the glory of Christ. Yeah, for those of you on Pal Talk, if you guys want to know what's going on, I'm live streaming on my YouTube channel. YouTube channel, it's live right now. And I'm addressing the comment section in the YouTube channel. Grace Girl just put the link. So if you guys want to go and interact with me on <clears throat> the comment section, please click the link and join. Now, just to refresh your memory, we saw from John 12, 37 to 41, John 12, 37 to 41, that according to John, who himself was inspired by the Spirit, pay attention with me, follow with me, make sure I'm not losing you, help me to help you, to bless you for the glory of Christ, because I want to make sure you walk away understanding the depth of Scriptures so that the Holy Spirit will just cause you to be even more in awe of how mind-blowing the Bible is and how real our God is and that Jesus is Jehovah God in the flesh. And that you understand these things and then you apply them and teach to others. I want you to learn these things so you can teach them to others, provided you're hearing correctly, understanding the point, so that you don't misinterpret these passages or misrepresent what I'm teaching. Right? Because that's happened before. Yes, and do subscribe to my YouTube channel. Werner Wolf. If you keep going after Andrew Martin, you will be banned. Andrew Martin is a confessing atheist. He doesn't belong to any church. Even though deep down inside, he's in love with Jesus. And it's a matter of time, he's going to return to Christ and make a confession of faith. He's a respectful, quote-unquote, atheist. Please don't harass the man and saying that he exposed himself to you. What's there to expose? What's there to expose? What's there to expose? The church fathers only have importance insofar that their view of Scripture is consistent and can be demonstrated to be consistent exegetically. So when you say how important their views are, it's like me asking you, how important are the views of the Reformers? You'll say, not much, because they're Johnny come lately. And I would rather listen to what the fathers had to say because they were closer to the time of the apostles, which I can address that. There's some truth to that, but just because you're closer to the apostles doesn't make you less prone to error and make you somehow infallible Orthodox believer. I can address that and show you, even from the New Testament writings, that this is the case. Right? But I'm trying not to allow myself to go off topic because I want to focus, right? I want to focus on the topic at hand. And thank the Lord for the admins to help me to help you. Admins, when you see troublemakers, do me a favor. Just bounce them. Block them. We don't have time for satanic distractions. Bob Nemo, welcome. He's from Paltok. He's joining us from Paltok. God bless you, Bob Nemo. Thank you for subscribing. I can use more subscribers. Werner Wolf, this man actually attacks Islam and actually supports Christians and actually encourages people to study the Bible and go to Christian channels such as myself. Andrew Martin is also known to joke and be sarcastic. So don't take it too seriously, Werner, Werner Wolf. Please. 
you're going to get to know Andrew Martin. Deep down inside, he has a love for Jesus. He loves Christians and he loves me. And he has a, a site attacking Islam. He actually tells people to come to my YouTube channel and the YouTube, YouTube channel of other Christians. So you're misunderstanding him. Sometimes he does like to take shots and joke and sarcastic because he understands that Christians are shocked that in confessing atheists, and I put in quotation marks, could be so pro-Christian and joining Christian chats to learn about the Bible to defend it against Muslims. And that's what he does. Okay. Now, everyone with me, are we ready to begin? The second part, <clears throat> yeah, Orthodox believer, the church fathers are important insofar that they provide an unbroken chain to the apostles showing that the faith that is preserved in the scriptures is a lived out faith that we can see in the the disciples of the apostles and their disciples after them so that <clears throat> what they're asking for is what's called an isnad, a sennad, a chain of transmission that you can trace back to Jesus and his companions. That's what they're basically telling you. So if the church fathers who have direct access to the apostles or are the successors of the apostles, disciples of the apostles didn't teach what you believe, then how can you trace these doctrines back to Christ and his followers. That's a similar argument that Orthodox, Roman Catholic, Coptic, and Nestorian Christians use. They use similar arguments as well. Right? They say, well, it's not in the church fathers. Werner, we're going to send you on your merry way. Send Werner out of here. We don't need people like him, an agent of Satan pretending to be a Christian. Look at the stupid questions he's asking me. Church father, semi-blasphemous? No, you're blasphemous. Your face is blasphemous. Your name is blasphemous. And people wonder why I'm rude. Someone who thinks he knows what he's talking about. Okay, let's begin, right? <clears throat> Are we ready? Are we ready to now start where I left off in the previous session? Okay, let me re remind you of the previous session that you need to go back and listen to. The previous session. I examined Isaiah's temple vision in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 10. And I examined what Isaiah said about the arm of Jehovah being revealed to the ends of the earth. Because the arm of Jehovah would be Jehovah's agent to bring his salvation to the ends of the earth in Isaiah 53, verse 1. To show that from the New Testament perspective, the arm of Jehovah and the Jehovah that Isaiah saw is none other than Jesus Christ in his pre-human existence who became flesh. So he sees the pre-human Jesus on the throne as Jehovah, beholding his glory in Isaiah 6. And then Isaiah prophesied that the arm of Jehovah will become a flesh and blood human being in order to become the servant of Jehovah, in order to die a vicarious death, a death to atone for our sins, and the New Testament identifies that arm of Jehovah as Jesus and the Jehovah that appeared to him in Isaiah 6 on the throne as Jesus Christ in his pre-human existence before he became man in his visible glory. You guys remember? Those who were listening to the previous talk, which I did two, two days ago, which is archived on my YouTube channel, Shemunian. You got to listen to it because I can't go back and cover all that ground. I can't do it. Because I want to continue where we left off, right? I promise you, if you study the arguments in that previous session and in today's session, you're going to make an irrefutable, exegetical, contextual case that Isaiah was no Unitarian, that he did affirm, because God made it known to him, that God is triune by nature, and that he did affirm the deity of the Messiah to come, because the Messiah is no mere human creature. He's the very eternal arm of Jehovah and therefore inseparable from Jehovah. Therefore, one with Jehovah who becomes flesh. Right? 
I've written articles on this all throughout my websites and blog on answeringislam.net. Go to individual authors, look for Shuma, and I have articles on this going in depth. So if we got that, I want to now continue where we left off. We left off briefly looking at Isaiah 52, 13. This is what I forgot to do. Darn it. Let me see if I can find the quote. Okay, do me a favor, brother, Protestant. If you can, repost Isaiah 52, 13 as I try to find this quote from the rabbi. Right? Let me see if I can follow. Yep. Let's see. Yeah, I should have found Look, see, I knew I was forgetting something. Sorry about that. Let me see if I can find it. Okay, I think I'll find it. Hold on. Yep, I found it. Thank the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. I'm going to read Isaiah 52, 13, and then I'm going to read to you a citation from a 14th century rabbi named Rabbi Moshe Kohen Ibn Crispin. Okay? Rabbi Moshe Kohen Ibn Crispin. I'll give you the link to the article now, and I'll put it in the description box later. Here's the link to my article. Okay? Here's the link to my article. I'm going to post it twice. Now, let me read Isaiah 52, 13. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled. If you guys have your Bibles open or you have a way of marking your Bibles or underlining your Bibles, mark, highlight, or underline exalted and extolled. Those two words, exalted and extolled. We're going to come back to them. We're going to look at those two terms in the context of Isaiah because this language of Isaiah clearly clearly affirms that the servant is no mere creature. The servant is God becoming flesh and being exalted to the position he enjoyed, but which he voluntarily set aside to humble himself, to become human and die to atone for the sins of the world. Right? Chris is a Christian now. I have no idea what Grace Girl is talking about here. Okay. Now, Isaiah 52, 13. Let me reread it. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently, shall be exalted and extolled. Exalted and extolled. Remember those two words. And be very high. Now, let me read what this rabbi says. A 14th century rabbi. Not a Christian. In fact, he'd be an anti-Christian. And he would want to shy away from interpreting Isaiah 52 in a manner that would put a weapon in the hands of Christians because this rabbi knew Christians were quoting this particular prophecy in reference to Jesus. So that would make him more reluctant. He'd be more reticent in saying something about Isaiah 52, which could be used by Christians to prove the deity of Jesus, right? You want me there? If you're a rabbi and you're writing... In the 14th century, 14th century, 1300s, you would want to interpret the Old Testament in such a way that doesn't put a weapon in the hands of the Christians to use against the Jews in order to convince them that Jesus is the Messiah, God in the flesh. In light of that, notice what he says anyway. This is in that article. It's a lengthy quote, <clears throat> but I'm going to read it because it's worth it. Notice even in his language, you can see the astonishment. Even this rabbi is astonished at the language Isaiah uses to describe the exaltation of the Messiah. Don't believe me? Let's begin. I will now proceed to my exposition. Behold, my servant shall have understanding. From the prophet saying understanding, it may be seen that all the lofty predicates which he assigns to him have their source in this attribute. In virtue of his comprehensive intelligence, it's not about the servant now, in virtue of his comprehensive intelligence, he will attain an elevation above that even of the most perfect men in the world. He'll be elevated above even the most perfect men in the world. Pay attention to the language of the rabbi. <clears throat> He shall be high and exalted and lofty exceedingly. According to the Midrash of our rabbis, meaning the interpretation, the plain inter interpretation of our rabbis, he'll be higher than Abraham. 
who was first of all a high fa father, and afterwards a father of a multitude. He'll be more exalted than Moses. So notice the rabbi saying, this servant is higher than Abraham, more exalted than Moses, who was exalted above the exalted ones of Levi, who was a prophet such that none arose like him in Israel, who saved Israel with a great salvation when they came out of Egypt, and the report of him, of whom, the report about Moses, right? <clears throat> spread into all places until the dukes of Edom were confounded before him, and trembling seized the mighty men of Moab, and all inhabitants of Canaan melted away. Guys, it gets even more astonishing. Notice, notice what the rabbi is now going to say. But this one will be exalted far above Moses. For when he gathers together our scattered ones from the four corners of the earth, he'll be exalted in the eyes of all the kings in the whole world, and all of them will serve him. Serve him. So the rabbi is admitting that this exalted servant will be served, i.e. worshipped, by all the kings of the whole world. And then he goes on to say, and will exalt him above, above them. As Daniel prophesies concerning him, all nations, peoples, and tongues shall serve him. Bam. I don't know if you caught it. Before I move on. The rabbi just... <clears throat> Quoted Daniel 7, okay, Daniel 7, verses 14 and 27. He quoted Daniel 7, verses 14 and 27, and tied them in with Isaiah 52, 13 in describing the servant. I'll give it to you a little later, Vine. Be patient, my brother. Sometimes you scare me, right? You're rushing to go nowhere. So Rabbi Moshe... Ibn Crispin said, Rabbi Moshe Cohen Ibn Crispin. See, now he's going to make me go and look for the name again. Vine, I think I need to block you and bounce you and then bring you back tomorrow. Rabbi Moshe Cohen Ibn Crispin. Like cr crispy treats. Okay. Notice what the rabbi just did. Notice what the rabbi just did. He just took Daniel 7, verses 14 and 27, and attributed them. To the servant of Isaiah 52, 13, combining Isaiah 52, 13 with Daniel 7, verse 14 and verse 27, just like Christians do. Just like Christians do. So why are the rabbis complaining when we Christians take Isaiah 52, 13 and apply it with Daniel 7, verse 14, in reference to the Messiah, combining these texts together, saying they all have the same referent in mind, the Messiah. Why do they complain when their own rabbis did it? Okay. But now let's continue the quotation. He'll be loftier than Solomon, whose dignity was <clears throat> so lofty that he is said to have sat on the throne of the Lord. And our rabbis say that he was king over both the upper and the nether world. But the king Messiah, this one is astonishing, in his all comprehending intelligence will be loftier than Solomon. What a lofty description of the intelligence of the Messiah. Did you catch it? The rabbi, a 14th century rabbi, quoted Isaiah 52, 13 in reference to King Messiah. You know, Melech Mashiach, Melech Mashiach. So here's a rabbi in the 1300 saying Isaiah 52, 13, Daniel 7, 14. They're both speaking of Melech Mashiach, King Messiah. And he says, King Messiah, his intelligence is all comprehending. All comprehending intelligence is simply another way of saying he's omniscient. 14th century friend, writing in the 1300s. Did you catch it? There you go. Oh, but it gets better. Let's go. Exceedingly above the ministering angels. Did you catch what he said? He'll be even above the angels. Well, what's left? He's above all humans. He's above all the, all the greatest of the prophets. Above Solomon, above Abraham, above Moses. Now he's above angels. What's left, Rabbi? You just place them above all creatures, exceedingly above the ministering angels because the same comprehensive intelligence will approach God more nearly than theirs. His intelligence 
is closer to God's than anyone else's intelligence, even that of angels. For it is an exceedingly high privilege that one whose nature is compounded material, meaning human, because our bodies compound, it's material, right? For someone with a compound nature, a material nature, what a privilege to describe such a one that he should attain to a grade of intelligence more nearly divine, more nearly divine. <clears throat> hold on. Let me send this, this dog on his way. Okay, hold on. More nearly divine. Hold on. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. One second, guys. We got a son of Satan, a Mohammedan, trying to distract. They never learn, do they? Sorry about that. Okay. Let's focus now. Okay, focus. More nearly divine than that which belongs to the incorporeal. Did you catch that? I don't know if it sunk in. Though he has a compound material nature, his intelligence is more nearly divine than those who are incorporeal, meaning angels. So it is said of him that his strength is greater than that of the ministering angels. Because these have no impediment in the exercise of their intellect, meaning they don't have a material body that would impede them or hinder them. Whereas that which is compound is continually impeded in consequence of material element in its nature. Let me break down this very technical language. Let me break down this very technical language. He's saying, though the Messiah is compound and material, he has a human body, a physical human body, a human nature, still his intelligence far surpasses that of the angels and is more divine than theirs and more closer to God's intelligence, which is something astonishing because angels are incorporeal. They're not compound, so they don't have a material body that impedes them, a nature that would hinder them from taking in God and understanding God more clearly. And yet this Messiah who's human, though he's compound, his intelligence far surpasses theirs. Right? Accordingly, the grade of his intelligence being such as this, he is said to be lofty exceedingly and his strength to be greater than the angels. When this servant of the Lord is born, he will continue to be marked by the possession of intelligence, enabling him to acquire from God what is impossible, what is impossible for any to acquire until he reaches that height, whether none of the sons of men except him has ever ascended. No human being has attained that height except him. From that day, he will be counted with his people, Israel, and will share their subjugation and distress. And in all their affliction, he will be exceedingly afflicted. And because of their being outcasts and scattered to the ends of the world, his grief will be such that the color of his countenance will be changed from that of a man, and pangs and sicknesses will see him, seize him. So he's going to share in our sufferings, specifically the nation of Israel. For great grief, as a physician knows, or as physicians know, by producing melancholy, subjects a man to many diseases, and all the chastisements which come upon him in consequence of his grief will be for our sakes not from any deficiency or sin on his part, which might bring punishment in his train, because he is perfect in the completeness of his perfection, as Isaiah says, truly, all his pains and sicknesses will be for us. This is from Rabbi Moshe Cohen Ibn Crispin, writing in the 14th century AD, cited by a book called The Suffering Servant of Isaiah, co-authored by Driver and Neubauer, pages 101, 103, which I have in my library. Here's the quote to my article that cites this. Okay, you understand what the rabbi just confirmed, folks? Do you understand what the rabbi... Remember, in the 1300s, Fully aware that Christians are using Isaiah 52, Isaiah 53, Daniel 7. Still, he cannot deny the messianic interpretation of these passages. Still, he cannot deny how astonishing the language is because he understands that what Isaiah said about the Messiah shows that he is greater than all creatures, angels and humans combined, 
And he more resembles God in his intelligence than anyone else because he could read Hebrew and could see how powerful the language is in describing the exaltation, the perfection, the glory of the Messiah. And he even quoted Daniel 7, verses 14 and 27, in reference to the Messiah, combining those passages with Isaiah 52, 13, agreeing with us that Isaiah 52 and Daniel 7 is all about, are all about, may the Lord Jesus loosen my tongue to speak proper grammar, are all about Messiah. Sinking in? You guys got it or no? Now, why would he say that? Why would a rabbi, who would you think would be reticent, reluctant to say that about Isaiah 52 and even say it's about Messiah, but he couldn't. He knew it's messianic. He knew the rabbis before him said it's about Messiah. And he knew the language there shows that this Messiah is no mere human. He transcends all humans greater than Abraham and Moses and Solomon and greater than the angels, greater than all creatures. Right? Why would he say this? What did he see in the language that made him think that what Isaiah sang about this being cannot be said of a mere ordinary man, though he doesn't take it as far and say he's God in the flesh, because then he'd really be a Christian then. Right? Let me show you why he said what he said. Here's the link to my article. I'll post it, post it in the description box. So you guys can use the material. Folks, again, please use the material. Study the material. Re-listen to the shows. Download them to your YouTube pages. Make short snippets of pertinent sections because they're quite lengthy. Pass them on. Don't edit them in such a way to make me say something I didn't say. And don't sell the material. You received it freely. Pass it on freely. So that more Christians can know how solid the Bible is, how irrefutable these doctrines are because they're based on Scripture and that the God revealed in this book is triune and Jesus is the God-man, the divine Messiah who became flesh. Like one Christian scholar said, if it was based on evidence, the whole world would be Christian because everything from science properly interpreted, archaeology properly interpreted, History, properly interpreted, fulfilled prophecies, the depth of the scriptures, the supernatural consistency of the scriptures, all of these sources point in the same direction. Jesus is the God-man who walked this earth, died for our sins, left the tomb empty. He is alive, and he'll return to judge the living and the dead. But it's not based on evidence. It's not based on evidence. It's based on the Holy Spirit taking the evidence and then convicting hearts and saying, wake up, awaken, open your eyes, open your heart, see the truth, because my, de my desire is for you to be saved, not condemned. Right? Here's the link to the article again. Now, let's unpack it. Jericho, praise the Lord. Maybe I should start working out to my, my lessons. That way, you know, I'll fall asleep behind the treadmill. All right. Now let's unpack why. Okay. Post Isaiah 52, 13 again, Protestant. And then I'm going to give you the link. Praise God for modern technology, BibleHub.com. Great resources. It has a phenomenal interlinear. It has the Bible in various languages. It has the Septuagint, right? It has the Aramaic. It has it all for you free of charge, you know. Use it. Pray God will keep it running. BlueLetterBible.org. BlueLetterBible.org. Dot org, another phenomenal resource, right? Blueletterbible.org and BibleGateway.com, all the popular versions of the Bible in various languages there for free. Use these resources. Now, as he puts Isaiah 52, 13, let me show you the two Hebrew words. And this is what's beautiful, modern, modern technology. Folks, you don't need to be a scholar of the languages. I promise you don't, because I'm not a scholar of the languages. I study the scholars. And trust the Holy Spirit to guide me understand what they're saying and separate the wheat from the chaff. But just a little knowledge of how to use lexicons and concordances and interlinears will help you make the point. Because here, you don't need to be a scholar to see the point I'm about to show you. Isaiah 52, 13. Behold, my servant shall be, shall 
deal prudently, he shall be exalted and extolled. Those two words, exalted and extolled. Okay, here's the link to the interlinear. If you're on my YouTube page, you'll see the link. You'll find it on BibleHub.com. Okay, folks. Sorry. Okay, here's the two words. And remember, Hebrew goes right to left. Right to left. So you're not reading left to right. Right to left. Hinna yaskil. By the way, it's because I'm reading the transliteration. Pray in time in Jesus' name. I can teach myself or have someone teach me to read the Hebrew script. Hinna yaskil. Is it yaskil? Yeah. Abdi. Now, the two words. Yarum wanisa. Yarum. He shall be exalted. Wanisa extol. Yarum nisa. Here's the words I want you to remember. Here's the words I want you to remember. Hold on. Okay. Ram and Nisa. Because Yarum comes from Ram. And those who speak Aramaic or Syrian, we use that word Ram. Rama. Ram. Hi. Nisa. Exalted. Can you remember those two words? Ab Abdi al- Abdi Halid, yeah, you guys, you speak Hebrew. He'll confirm what I'm about to say. Abd a Halid. Confirm that every one of these passages that I'm about to cite is going to use the words Ram Nisa. Ram Nisa. Okay, brother? You confirm. Let's go to Isaiah 6, verse 1. Isaiah 6, verse 1. Let's read it. When he posted, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord Adonai sitting upon a throne, thrown high and lifted up. Guess what the words high lifted up are? High is Ram, lifted up is Nisa. Okay, here it is. Now, this is where I end last session. This is where I end last session. Go here. I think First Last also posted it. Isaiah 6 1. The throne is Ram Wanisa. Same two Hebrew words. Same two Hebrew words. Now, Abd a Halij, who reads Hebrew, speaks Hebrew. Do you see what he said? Confirm. Folks, you understand what Isaiah 52 is telling you? You understand what? Isaiah 52, 13 is telling you, Isaiah is confirming the New Testament. He's confirming the arm of Jehovah becomes a man to die a humiliating death to atone for our sins. And then in response, God raises him up and exalts him to his throne. That's exactly what the New Testament teaches. Because when it says, my servant will be high and lifted up, that is Isaiah's way of saying, God will exalt the servant to his own throne. You understand it? It's Isaiah 6.1. And then when you tie in, guys, pay attention. When you tie in John telling you in John 12, 40 to 41, that the Jehovah whose glory Isaiah saw in Isaiah 6, that Jehovah appeared to him visibly on the throne that Isaiah saw was Jesus Christ in his pre-human existence. This then confirms Jesus was on the throne, right? Jesus was on the throne because he is Jehovah God, the arm of Jehovah, one with Jehovah and therefore Jehovah, the voice of Jehovah who commissioned Isaiah and spoke on behalf of the Godhead, who then became man and humbled himself to die a humiliating death. And then God exalted him to the throne, not for the first time, but once again. Which then confirms what our Lord said in John 17, verse 5. And now, Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory I had with you before the world was. Isaiah already announced that, saw that, 
over 700 years before the birth of Christ because the Spirit revealed it to Isaiah. So Isaiah was a Trinitarian who knew the arm of Jehovah is the voice of Jehovah who would become flesh, become the Messiah, to die for our sins, and God would raise him to life and exalt him to the throne. Isaiah knew all this by revelation of the Holy Spirit. Are you catching where I'm going with this? Yeshayahu is the Hebrew name for Isaiah, by the way. Yeshayahu. Are you catching this? I need them to as apologists, and I need a blessing. Actually, he's writing in the 700s, Protestant believer, not 620 BC. He's writing in the 8th century, 700s. You guys had to have heard the first session, the first part of this, which I did two, two days ago, to better appreciate what I'm saying now. Okay. Now, let me give you some more examples. Let's go to Isaiah 57, 15. Isaiah 57, 15. Abda, Abd a Halij is quoting you the Hebrew. And he's confirming to you it's the same words. Ram Nisa. Now read Isaiah 57, 15 for me, guys. Here's Jesus in Isaiah 57, 15. Here's Jesus. Read. For thus saith the high, guess what the word high is? And lofty one. And guess what the word lofty one is? Guess what the word high is? And guess what the word lofty one is? This is what the Ram and Nisa one says. High is Ram, lofty one is Nisa. The same two words again, folks. Jehovah just said, I am the high, Ram, lofty one, Nisa, that inhabiteth eternity, the one who is eternal, everlasting, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high, Ram, and holy place. But then notice why I say Jesus. With him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. You see what? Jehovah just said, Yehovah just said, I am the high Ram, lofty one, Nisa. I dwell in a high Ram and holy place. I am the one who inhabits eternity, the one who lives forever. But I am also humble and humble myself to dwell with the broken, the contrite in heart and spirit in order to revive him. Though I am transcendent, I'm also eminent and close. And that's what Jesus did. The high one became the humble one to associate with us. You caught it or no? Our God is not like Allah who calls himself Al-Mutakabbir. One of the names of Allah is Al-Mutakabbir. Al-Mutakabbir means the proud one. The conceited one, the arrogant one. That's one of the names of Allah. And the Quran says he hates all who are of the mutakabirun, mutakabirin, and he'll throw them in hell. And yet he calls himself El Mutakabir. Don't believe me. Ask any native Arabic speaker. El Mutakabir means the proud one. Yes, this is Sam Shamoon from Paltok. In fact, speak big truth. I'm actually broadcast, broadcasting this in Paltok in Child of God's room right now. Al-Mutakabir means the proud one, the conceited one, the arrogant one. God says, no, I'm not that. I am the high, Ram, lofty one, Nisa. I do inhabit the high Ram and holy place, and I inhabit eternity. I live forever. But I dwell with the humble, the broken hearted, the contrite at heart to revive him. That's Jesus. Jesus perfectly manifests the transcendence of God, he is other, and the humbleness of God, his eminence, his desire to be with us. Do you understand why the rabbi and other rabbis saw why Isaiah 52, 13 was amazing? Because God is saying, 
My servant will be Ram Nisa, high and lifted up. But wait, God, those are the same two, two terms used elsewhere in Isaiah to refer to your status. You are the high and lofty one. Your throne is high and lifted up. You dwell in the high place. What do you mean that the servant is high and lifted up? Are you saying that this servant shares in your status, your transcendence over creation? Yes, that's what Isaiah was saying. You see how much meat there is in the Old Testament for the multi-personal nature of God, for the deity of the Messiah, not just his humanity. If you have eyes to see by the Spirit to find these nuggets, the meat, the depth. You with me there? But it gets a little better. Isaiah 33, 5. Isaiah 33, 5. And Abd al Halich will confirm again if it's the same Hebrew words. Here's the interlinear. Abd al Halich. I like that name, man. I like pronouncing it too. Here. The Jehovah is exalted, for he dwelleth on high. He hath filled Zion with judgment and righteousness. Here's the link. Jehovah is exalted. He will dwelleth on high. Let's see what the words are. The first one in this gap, okay. Or is it an S? Nishgab. Okay. He dwells on high. Marom. Dwells on high is Ram. Ram. Jehovah dwells on high. Ram. Okay. That's one of the words. But this one is the one that's going to blow you away. This one is going to blow you away. Are you ready to get blown away? Isaiah 33 verse 10. Isaiah 33, verse 10. Hope you guys are following along and understanding the issues. Isaiah 33, verse 10. Now I will rise, said Jehovah. Now will I be exalted. Now will I lift up myself. Now let's see what the last two words are. I just gave you the link. I will be exalted. It's Eromam, Ram. And Nasi, Nisa. I will be exalted, Ram. I will lift myself up. Nisa. Abd al Halij. Is it again a passage where the two words Ram and Nisa are used to describe Jehovah's exaltation? And it's there in the link. I gave it to you. Is it? Can you confirm that? Abd al Halij. Same two words. And there's a link. Eromam, it's from Ram. And Nasi is Nisa. So I want to make sure if he's here. Okay, both of them, right? Yes, because Hebrew and Aramaic are sister languages. But you guys didn't catch it, though. Let's read. Let's read Isaiah 33, 10 again. You didn't catch it, though. Psalm 55, if you emailed me, I respond to your email. You never responded back. See, Ab al halaj who speaks Hebrew, reads Hebrew, just confirmed it. But he's going to do three, three things. Now will I rise. Just like Jesus rose from the dead. Now I will rise. Now will I be exalted. Now will I lift up myself. Rise, exalted, lift it up. That's exactly what happened to Jesus. Raised from the dead. Now I will rise. Will I rise? Now will I be exalted. Now will I be lifted up. Lifted up myself. Rise, exalted, lift it up. I know Abd al Halaj. We know Hebrew is a daughter of the Assyrian language. At least you admit that. When we tell that to people, they'll think we're being arrogant. Here's a Jew who admits it. Did you guys catch it now? Vine, did you catch it? Jehovah says, Now will I rise. Now will I exalt be exalted. Now will I be lifted up. Rise, exalted, lifted up. You guys catch it or no?
So you see how the pair of words, Ram, Nisa, are used for Jehovah, to describe Jehovah's throne, to describe Jehovah's exaltation above creation, his transcendence over creation. Ram, Nisa, everyone got that? Now, if you got it, let's go back to Isaiah 52, 13. Isaiah 52, 13. Let's read it again. Isaiah 52, 13. Yep, Pedro, because I'm a meat eater. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted, lifted high, extolled, lifted up. Now when you understand the use of those terms, okay, wait. In Isaiah 6, 1, Jehovah's throne is high and lifted up. Same two words, Ram and Nisa. In Isaiah 57, 15, Jehovah says, I am the high and lofty one. I am the Ram and Nisa, who inhabits eternity, who lives forever. I dwell in the high Ram and holy place, but also with him who is contrite at heart to revive the spirit of the, con the contrite at heart. Okay. Isaiah 33, 5, I dwell on high, Ram. Isaiah 33, 10, I will rise, says Jehovah. I will be exalted, Ram. I will be lifted up, Nisa. The language that is, you re, routine, ru, Lord, loosen my tongue by the power of the Holy Spirit. Routinely, routine, root, routine, root, routinely, loosen my tongue, Holy Spirit, for the glory of Jesus Christ. Routinely used for Jehovah's exalted status, transcendence, transcendence over creation, that he is above, supreme over creation, distinct from creation, holds supremacy over creation, is used for the servant. This is Isaiah's way of telling you that the servant, when he finishes his role on earth, offering his human life as a sacrifice, after he dies, Jehovah will then raise him up again and exalt him to his status. So the servant is being exalted to the status of Jehovah, to sit enthroned with Jehovah, to reign with Jehovah, and Jehovah's transcendence over creation. But when will Jehovah exalt him and lift him up? Let's go to Isaiah 53, verses 9 to 12. Isaiah 53, verses 9 to 12. Isaiah 53, verses 9 to 12. I don't know why he's giving us 52. This guy's really dropping the ball. I think he's getting amnesia. It's become a pattern with you, you little sinner. I don't pay you nothing for nothing. Okay. Isaiah 53, verses 9 to 12. And he made his grave with the wicked, so the servant dies. The servant dies. And with the rich in his death, so he's dead. He dies. Guys, notice our language of nine. He's dead because they assign him a grave and then he's buried with the rich or the, with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. So he's dead, right? Grave, death. Clearly this servant dies. But now why does he die and what happens after he dies? Pay attention. Yet it pleased Jehovah to bruise him. Please Jehovah to bruise him. He hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. The, the Hebrew word, and Abd al halaj will confirm, is asham. Asham is guilt offering. The guilt offering prescribed in the law of Moses. So he's going to offer his soul as a sacrifice to atone for guilt. When he makes his soul an offering for guilt, asham, he shall see his seed. Well, folks, how can someone who's dead and buried see seed again? The seed of those who believe and shall prolong his days. How can someone's days be prolonged if he's dead and buried? And the pleasure of Jehovah shall prosper in his hand. How can the pleasure of Jehovah prosper in his hand if he's dead and buried? He shall see, see the travail of his soul, meaning the result of his pain and suffering. He'll see the fruit of it, what it results in, and be satisfied. How can someone dead be satisfied by the results of his death? By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. How can he justify anyone if he's dead? 
For he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he had poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Do you understand? Asham Abd al Halaj. It's Asham offering for guilt. How can someone assign the grave who was put to death with the rich, see, see, see the travail of his soul, have Jehovah's pleasure prosper in his hand, divide the spoils with the great when he's dead and buried? What's the answer? What's the answer? Because Jehovah raises him to exalt him to a high and lofty place. In other words, you rabbis, whether you like it or not, Isaiah 52, 13 and 53, 12 proclaims over 700 years before the birth of Jesus, his vicarious death, dying as a sacrifice for sin, resurrection and exaltation to the throne of God. No wonder Isaiah is called the fifth gospel. Yeah, whether you want to go with the reading of the Dead Sea Scrolls or not, even with the later Masoretic textual tradition, it's still plain as day, closed on Sunday. Now, closed on Sunday, do you see how I use Isaiah 53 to destroy the attempt of the Unitarians to disassoci disassociate Jesus from being Jehovah in Isaiah 6? Because a proper reading of Isaiah 53 reinforces the identity as of the servant as Jehovah. That's why I didn't answer you right away. If you're patient, you wait. When you unpack these passages, then even if they run to Isaiah 53, they're still stuck with the fact that there he's called the arm of Jehovah. And the arm of Jehovah is no creature, but he's an inseparable, intrinsic part of God's being. Therefore, he must be Jehovah. Which is why he shares in his exaltation. Everyone else got it? Did you get it or did I confuse anybody? Anyone confused? Exactly, Riaz. Isaiah 52 and 53 teaches the servant is the arm of Jehovah. Therefore, he's no creature. Jehovah's arm is his infinite eternal power that becomes flesh. So he's the God man. And yet this God man dies as a sacrifice for our sins. And then he's raised to life again and exalted to the throne of God. And the reason why he can share in God's throne, because he's one with God, being the arm of God, and therefore inseparable from him, though distinct from him, and can have a relationship with him. And this is all in Isaiah, long before the Gospels written, before the New Testament. Are you serious? And they tell me you can't use the Old Testament to prove the Trinity or the two natures of Messiah or his vicarious death, resurrection, and glorification. Seriously? Ah, but it's going to get juicier. Are you ready for the juice with the meat? Isaiah 53, 9. I don't think you caught it. Isaiah 53, 9. You still, and, and again, Abd el Halich. Can you confirm what I'm about to say? Because you read Hebrew. Abd el Halich. And he made his grave with the wicked. That's plural. Pay attention. The Hebrew is plural. He made his grave with wicked ones and with the rich. That's singular in his death. Okay. How can his grave be assigned with wicked ones, but then somehow in his death be identified with a rich person? One. The Hebrew for rich is singular. The Hebrew for wicked is plural. Wicked ones. That's what happened when Jesus was crucified alongside two wicked ones, and he would have been buried with the wicked ones until a rich man intervened and buried him in his tomb. Bam, baby. There you go. Didn't catch it. No, 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 you didn't catch it. Abd al Halij, can you confirm, and I'm going to give you the link, that wicked is plural. It means wicked ones, more than one, and that rich is singular, one. Here it is. Don't take my word for it. Here's the Hebrew. 
There you go. Yeah, it is true, Alex. That's not if. Here, Abd al Halaj, confirm and put it in Hebrew. See, he's telling you, I'm right, and he put it in Hebrew. So, literally, it says, here's the link. Literally, it says, right, he was assigned a grave with wicked ones. Jesus was crucified with two wicked ones, and had Joseph of Arimathea not intervened, he would have been buried in a common grave with the wicked ones. But then a rich man intervened and buried him in the rich man's tomb, making sense out of Isaiah 53, verse 9, which for over 700 years until this day to the rabbis who reject Jesus do not understand why wicked ones and a rich man singular. Do you know that? Again, Abd al Halij, he speaks Hebrew, reads Hebrew. Can you say and put it in caps? Yes, Sam is right. That's what the Hebrew says. And I gave you the link to the Hebrew. Here it is. Rasaim, plural. Oh, I'm sorry. It's Rasaim. Sorry about that, Rasha. Sometimes I misread that little. Half circle mark on top of S. That means you have to pronounce it sh. Rasha'im. And if you click on it, on that link, Rasha'im, plural. But then the rich. And look at the bottom. You're going to see it says A-D-J-M-P. A-D-J means adjective. M means masculine. P means plural. Do you see at the bottom of the word wicked? That P means plural. Then you look at the word for Ashir, the rich. A-D-J, adjective. M masculine. S singular. It's right there. You don't need to know Hebrew. Right there. No, 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 close, close on Sunday. No, 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 no. Death is plural, not because of the intensity of his death. No, 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 no. Do you know why death is plural? Right? When it's using the plural for his death, do you know why? Because he tastes death for all humanity. All the deaths that human beings deserve to die are consummated somewhat su summed up in his own death. Hebrews 2 9. That's why. No, 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 no. It's not the intensity of his death, it's because he dies for the many. The deaths that human beings deserve, he dies their deaths for them. That one death consummates all the deaths of all those that he atones for. And that's what Hebrews 2.9 says. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. That's why it's plural. He's not dying the death of one person. He's dying the death of all human beings who deserve to die for their sins. So the plural is affirming the fact that it's an atoning death that sums up the deaths of everyone who deserve to die in that one death. That's why his sacrifice is called sacrifices in Hebrews 9.23. It's plural because his one sacrifice subsumes, takes in, consummate all the sacrifices of the sacrificial system. His one death is the burnt offering, the, the sin offering, the guilt offering, the peace offering, right? It's all these offerings, the daily and evening sacrifices. That one death, that one sacrifice subsumes, takes in, consummates all the sacrifices and all the deaths of all the sinners that he came to die for. Medic, it's supernatural because it's the gift of the grace of the Holy Spirit filling us, filling me to teach you. He's filling me, Medic, to teach you. He didn't give me this to keep it to myself. And I need the Holy Spirit to protect me 
from this wicked, evil, satanic world, this wicked, evil judge, and keep me free to glorify Christ and to be holy and pure and delight his heart and to help me to keep getting my health. That's why he's. I have these insights for your benefit because now you're going to take these insights, medic, and you're going to share it with others so they can be blown away as you're blown away and they share it with others and others are blown away until Jesus returns. Thank you, John McDermott. I need it. So did Isaiah 53, 9 blow every one of you away, especially Vine? Now, why do I keep mentioning Vine? Vine is a special case in that he used to be a monk for over 10 years. He's gone to seminary. He teaches seminary students theology. And here, in the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, here's a man humble enough to learn from someone like me who's been to no seminary, no university, but because he loves truth and loves Jesus, he believes that I can teach him by the power of the Holy Spirit. Talk about humbleness. May God bless him and all of you for the glory of Christ. Right? An ex-monk, man. So, did everyone understand the impact of Isaiah 53.9? For 700 years till now, the rabbis cannot give you a good explanation why it says his grave was assigned. His grave was assigned. Yeah, but those will be future seminarians. So I'll prophesy. With the wicked ones, but with a rich man singular in his death. You know, if you ask the rabbi, he can't answer that. He'll, he'll tap dance and come up with something. But let's look at Isaiah 53 verse 9 one more time. Psalm 55, why would you want to write me a new email? Respond to the old email. And made his grave with the wicked ones and with the rich man singular in his death. We have the answer, folks. Eugenio Carmo, God bless you. It's humbling because, Eugenio Carmo, you're doing two things. You're showing that the Holy Spirit is truly using me in a miraculous way, filling me with knowledge for the glory of Christ which means that the Holy Spirit is pleased to use me for the glory of Christ, and I take that and I do belong to him. Thank you, Holy Spirit. And secondly, what you're showing, Eugenio Carmo, you don't need to go to Bible college. All you need is to trust the Holy Spirit and beseech him and beg him to guide you to all truth, and he will. But you, you see the point there, right? Guys, isn't it mind-blowing that Isaiah, even meticulous, minute detail, he says he was assigned a grave with wicked ones, but with the rich man, singular, in his death. Minute, meticulous detail that rabbis who reject Jesus can't explain, not honestly anyway. And then we come to the Gospels. Jesus would have died and would have been thrown into the common grave of the criminals because that's what the romans did they would take the bodies of those who were crucified and throw them in a common grave and let the scavengers come and eat their flesh until one rich man buried him in his tomb wow tell me those details are not amazing and you know the authenticity of these reports you know why you know the gospels are not making it up let me tell you why you know the gospels are not making it up number one they never tell you that this fulfills Isaiah 53, 9. You would think if they're making it up, they would go out of their way to make the connection explicit, right? Sarah Laps, I tried to look for your comment. In the comment section, it didn't show up. Did you delete it? Okay, you, you with me there? If they're making up a story to fit it in with Isaiah 53, 9, you'd expect at least they would make it explicit. They don't even mention Isaiah 53, 9. They don't even bring it up in recounting the story of Joseph and the Sanhedrin. And the second line of evidence showing this is a genuine historical event. They weren't making it up. It was the Sanhedrin that condemned Jesus to death. Why then would you make up a story where a member of the Sanhedrin is the one who buries Jesus in his tomb? Beyond that, the Gospels were in within the generation of the eyewitnesses, or at least within the first two generations, when people were still alive and around 
who could have falsified and exposed any lies in the gospel message. So if the story of Jer Joseph of Arimathea was made up, how did they get away with it? And we don't have any dissenting voices <clears throat> debating this assertion or refuting this assertion. You with me there? So that's how we can trust the story of Joseph of Arimathea is a fact of history. It's historical. Let me repeat the reasons. If they were making up the story in order to tie it into Isaiah 53, 9, at the very least, they would make that connection explicit. They don't. They don't even bother to bring up Isaiah 53, 9 in reference to Joseph of Arimathea. And if you didn't know Hebrew and you were not a careful reader, you wouldn't make the connection like many of us haven't made it. Even you guys in seminary or Bible college, you guys who went to Bible college and seminary. Did anyone bring out that meticulous detail of Isaiah 53 verse 9? Okay. So the authors, at the very least, you'd expect them to say, oh, and this is to fill Isaiah 53 9, and they don't because they're not making up stories. They're simply reporting historical facts. And now, Alex, how many people besides yourself has hunted down a commentary like Pulpit's Commentary to find a commentary highlighting this point. How many people are like you? The second reason why we know it's historical. The Sanhedrin, the, the 71, 71 members of the Sanhedrin, not all of them, obviously, because there are some who are for Jesus, but the Sanhedrin, some of them, not all of them, some of them, not all of them, because not all of them were there that night, condemned Jesus to death and were his opponents. Why would you make up a story of a member of the Sanhedrin coming to the aid of Christ and giving him a burial, not an honorable burial, because an honorable burial means he would have been buried in his own, let's say, ancestral home and let's say his family tomb, but still a burial, a burial that was more honorable than having his body tossed to a common grave for dogs to consume. Why mention him? In fact, the only reason why we know of Joseph of Arimathea is because he is mentioned in reference to Jesus' burial. If nothing was said about him burying Jesus, no one would even talk about Joseph of Arimathea because he'd be irrelevant. And the third fact is the Gospels are written early enough where there are thousands of eyewitnesses, both hostile and friendly, who could contest this assertion if it wasn't based on historical fact, and yet no one refuted it, no one opposed it, because they didn't make it up. They were accurately reporting the historical event. Clear? Is that clear? Now, I'm trying to give you a minute for it to sink in. And I want this to settle in by the power of the Holy Spirit because what you just got was more miraculous divine proof. The Bible is the word of God, and Jesus is the God-man, the ones whom the prophets saw in advance by revelation of the Holy Spirit, believed in him, trusted in him, hoped in him, loved him, and knew he was their savior which goes with the other session I'm doing. How were the Old Testament prophets saved? This goes with this because it shows you that Isaiah was saved because of the Messiah, whom he proclaimed to be the God-man, the eternal arm of Jehovah, who became flesh to die as a sacrifice for his sins and the sins of the whole world, whom God then raised and exalted to his throne. Isaiah knew all that. So if I asked you, how was Isaiah saved? By grace, through faith in Jesus the Messiah that he saw in advance, prophesied his coming, identified him as the God-man who would offer his life as a sacrifice for his sins and the sins of the world, whom God raised and exalted to his throne. Isaiah knew all this. 
Do you understand now why Isaiah is called the fifth gospel? And if I add Isaiah 9, verses 1 to 2, 6 to 7, it gets even more astonishing. If I add Isaiah 9, verses 1 to 2, and 6 to 7, it gets even more astonishing. Because he says, a great light will shine from Galilee of the nations. Great light will shine from Galilee of the nations to those who are in darkness. And that great light will be a child who is born, a son who is given. The government will be on his shoulders, and this child will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, El Gibor, the very title of Jehovah, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, who sits on the throne of David to uphold it, maintain it from that time forever, forever. The child born to sit on David's throne is called El Gibor, Mighty God, Isaiah 9, 6. And he's a child who is born. You know, that's a powerful... Reference, because the Hebrew word child born is Yelet Yulad, Abdel or Abd al Halij. Confirm that the words are Yelet Yulad, child born. And the child born is El Gibor, mighty God. Now, you know why that's amazing? Because Isaiah, over 700 years before the birth of Christ, and how many years was that? Over 1400 years before Muhammad said that God will be born, thereby refuting what Muhammad said in chapter 112, verse 3 of the Quran, where Allah says, Lam yalit wa lam yulad. Yalit, yulad. That's the Arabic equivalent of these Hebrew words, yalit yulad. Muhammad's God says, Lam yalit wa lam yulad. I neither beget nor am I born. Isaiah's God says, I will be born as a child to reign on David's throne. Using the very words, cognate words. In Hebrew, it's yelid, yulad. In Arabic, welid. Same words. So Muhammad's God says, chapter 112, verse 3, pay attention to how it sounds. Lam yelid, I neither beget. Lam yulad, neither born. But Isaiah God says, Yelid Yulad, a child born who's the mighty God. So Isaiah's God will be born as a child. Muhammad's God says, no, I won't. Therefore, Muhammad's God is not the God of Isaiah. Did you catch it or no? Let's look at Isaiah 9, 6, because this is going to be icing on the cake. Isaiah 9, verse 6. Exactly, Alex Gaskin. The God who inhabits eternity, who is high and lofty, humbles himself to dwell with the broken and the contrite spirit, which is exactly what Jesus did. He is the transcendent and eminent God all in one. Isaiah 9, verse 6. Let's read it together. For unto us a child is born. Unto us the Son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, El Gibor. El Gibor, the Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, right? Now, let's look at Isaiah 10, 20 to 21. Isaiah chapter 10, verses 20 to 21. Who is El Gibor, Mighty God? And here I'll give you the interlinear. Who is El Gibor, the Mighty God? Here's the, here's the interlinear for Isaiah 9, 6. Look at the words. It's El Gibor. El Gibor. Okay. Now let's read Isaiah 10, 20, 21. Let's read. And it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as are escaped of the house of Jacob shall no more again stay upon him that smote them, but shall stay upon the Lord, Yahovah. They will depend on the Lord, lean on the Lord, Jehovah, the Holy One of Israel in truth to save them. The remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob, unto the mighty God. Wow. In the space of two chapters, Isaiah calls two figures the mighty God, El Gibor. He says the child born is the mighty God, El Gibor. But then he says Jehovah is the mighty God, El Gibor. And I gave you the link to the Hebrew of Isaiah 9, 6. There it is, El Gibor. Now let's see what the Hebrew for El, uh, mighty God is in Isaiah 10, 21. Here it is. Here you go. 
There you go. And read what it is. El Gibor. Same Hebrew words. Jehovah in Isaiah 10 is said to be El Gibor. The child born in Isaiah 9 is said to be El Gibor. But then I'm really confused. I'm more confused. Isaiah tells us over and over again, there is no other God besides Jehovah, and Israel's God is only one. Let's go to Isaiah 43, 10 to 11. Isaiah 43, 10 to 11. Exactly, Kabara, Allah Kabara, Psalm 55. Isaiah 43, 10 to 11. Ye are my witnesses, saith Jehovah, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. But wait, Jehovah, a child is born who is the mighty God. But you said there is no God after you. No God will be formed after you. I Even I am Jehovah, and beside me there is no Savior. I'm getting confused, Jehovah. You're confusing me. A child is born, and he's the mighty God. But you just said, no God before you, no God after you. No God shall be fashioned after you. Isaiah 45, 5 to 6. Isaiah 45, 5 to 6. I'm almost done with this session. I still got a little more, some other points to make. I am Jehovah, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am Jehovah, and there is none else. Jehovah, yes, there is someone else. The child born is the mighty God. People are going to call him the mighty God in recognition that he's the mighty God who is born. And then the servant is your arm, Jehovah. And then the servant exalted to your throne, Jehovah. What's going on? The servant is your arm, exalted to your throne, because he's high lifted up, the very language describing your transcendence and your throne over creation. And now he's the child born who's called the mighty God. So he's distinct from you because he's your servant, he's your arm, and he's a child born. But being your arm, being the mighty God who shares in your throne, somehow he has to be one with you. In some sense, he has to be one with you. And on top of that, a child born and the servant who dies speak to his humanity that he's truly human. So human that he's born like humans. Oh, so Isaiah prophesied the incarnation of God. God would be born as a genuine human being over 700 years before Jesus walked this earth. <whistles> sinking in? I want to give you a minute to sink in, to sink in. Yeah. Okay. Okay, let's go to Isaiah 53, 11 and 12, so he can put the icing on the cake again. Isaiah 53, 11 and 12. Let's look at this again. Now I'm going to remind you of what I discussed in the previous session, so we can put the icing on the cake. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge, my servant, shall my righteous servant justify many. Notice, my servant, who is righteous, will justify, will declare and make men, many righteous. For he shall bear their iniquities. Now notice 12. Therefore will I divide him, portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoiled with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressor, transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. So notice what the servant does. He bears the sins of many, he makes many righteous, just, declares them to be righteous, and he makes intercession. He makes intercession. Okay, let's go to Isaiah 59, 16. Let's re repeat what I discussed in the previous session because we're preachers of repetition. We need to hear something over and over again for it to sink in so we can use it, absorb it for the glory of Christ. Okay, Isaiah 59, 16. The servant is righteous. He makes many righteous. He bears the sins of many. He makes intercession. 
But Isaiah 59, 16, I mentioned this again in the last session. I got to mention it again so it could sink in. And he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his arm brought salvation unto him and his righteousness, it sustained him. God was disgusted that he couldn't find any human being worthy enough to intercede. So God used his own arm to do it, to bring righteousness, justification, his own arm to do it. But wait, the servant is a man. He's human. He justifies. He makes righteous. He bears the sins of many. He makes intercession. It's not either or. It's both. It's strength and power. You have to have power to have strength. And if you, you're strong, you're powerful. Okay. Now, Isaiah 63 verse 5. Isaiah 63 verse 5. See, many of you forgot already what I discussed in the previous session. This was all in the previous session. Isaiah 53 verse 5. Okay, watch here. I'm sorry, Isaiah 63 verse 5. 63 verse 5 because we keep talking about Isaiah 53. And I look, pay attention, Jehovah speaking again. And I look, there was none to help. Nobody, no one could assist and help me. And I wondered, I was astonished that there was none to uphold. Therefore, mine own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury it upheld me. Okay, Jehovah, there was no one worthy enough, no man good enough to intercede to bring righteousness and salvation. So your own arm brought salvation and judgment. Yes, your own arm, right? Yes, because there was no creature, no human worthy enough. But didn't you just have Isaiah say, the servant who is human, he bore the sin of many. He justifies many, makes them righteous, and makes intercession, all of which you said no one was good enough, no man, no human was able to do, which is why your own arm had to do it for you. Yes. How does that work, Jehovah? Because let me repeat, let me repeat what I mentioned previous session. Isaiah 53, verses 1 to 2. Isaiah 53, verses 1 to 2. You guys have to hear the first part of the session, which I did two, two days ago. Now, here's the answer to the dilemma. Who hath believed our report? To whom is the arm of Jehovah revealed? Jehovah's arm has now been revealed in the sight of all flesh. For he, he, the pronoun, <clears throat> reverts back to the arm. The arm of Jehovah, he, it's referring to the arm of Jehovah, shall grow up before him. As a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground, he, the arm of Jehovah, the nearest antecedents to the pronouns is the arm of Jehovah. The arm of Jehovah is the he that will grow up before Jehovah, is the he that comes out of dry ground, that has no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, the arm of Jehovah, there is no beauty that we should desire him. So Isaiah 53 says Jehovah's righteous servant is actually his arm. The arm that Jehovah used to bring about salvation, intercession, righteousness, and atonement for sin because there was no creature, so his own arm had to do it for him. Send Sanctus Manifesto on a very sanctimonious path. You guys caught it? Do you understand now why the servant... Can bring God's salvation to the ends of the earth? You understand now why God's servant can justify, make righteous many? You understand why God's servant can make intercession and bear the sins of many? You understand why God's servant can be exalted to the status of God? Because he's not a creature. He is the very arm, the eternal arm, the inseparable arm of Jehovah. You caught it? Let's see what else it says about the arm of Jehovah. Okay? Let's go to Isaiah 33, 2. Uh, exactly, Alex Gaskin. Isaiah 33, 2. Let us see what Isaiah says about this arm. Oh, Jehovah, be gracious unto us. We have waited for thee. 
Be thou their arm every morning, our salvation also a time of trouble. trouble. You notice how God's arm is being connected with salvation? Where God's arm is, there is salvation. Are you making the connection? Be our arm, meaning our Savior. Where the arm of Job is, there is salvation. Are you catching it? Isaiah 30, 30. Isaiah 30, 30. Watch here. And Jehovah shall cause his glorious voice to be heard. Do you catch the voice? Aha. Uh -huh. Wait, wait, wait. Voice to be heard. And shall show the lighting down of his arm with the indignation of his anger and the flame of a devouring fire with scattering and tempest and hailstones. Wait, wait, wait. Notice the connection with the voice of Jehovah and the arm of Jehovah. The voice of Jehovah and the arm of Jehovah. Did you guys catch those two or no? Wait, wait, before you move on. The arm of Jehovah and the glorious voice of Jehovah. The lighting, the arm of Jehovah will light up, will appear, will be manifested. But do you see the connection with the glorious voice of Jehovah and the arm of Jehovah? Everyone caught it there? If someone didn't catch it, put it to. Because here is the connection with Isaiah 6. The voice of Jehovah, the arm of Jehovah. Isaiah 6, verse 8. Isaiah 6, verse 8. And I mentioned this in the previous session as well. I got to repeat it again to tie it in with this session. Isaiah 6, verse 8. Also, I heard the voice of Adonai. I heard the voice saying, whom shall I send and who'll go for us? <whistles> then said I, here am I, send me. Wait, wait, wait. Isaiah heard Jehovah's voice speaking. The voice was speaking and the voice said, whom shall I send and who'll go for us? The us is the voice and Jehovah. That explains the plural, Alex, because the voice is speaking for Jehovah. He can then say, who'll go for us? I, Jehovah's voice and Jehovah, who'll go for the both of us? And when you speak, when you use your voice, what are you hearing? You're hearing the word. So the voice of Jehovah is none other than the word of Jehovah, who reveals Jehovah and commissions Jehovah's servants. Yeah, it's Isaiah 6, 8. CP, it said it right there. Whom shall I send who will go for us? Why the us? Because it's the voice and Jehovah. Jehovah and Jehovah's voice. Jehovah's voice speaking. They do see it growing. And the Aramaic paraphrases of the Old Testament, the Targumim, it's called the Targumim. All throughout the Targums, the Jews refer to what's known as the Memra Maran, the word of God whom they identify as a messenger sent by God, who is personal, who speaks, who's identified as God, claims to be God, and is worshipped as God. So they saw it even before the Christians did. See, he just gave you, Abd al-Halaj just gave you the Aramaic paraphrase of Isaiah 6, 8. And there they identified it as... The word, the glorious voice. Yes, because growing, their problem is not with the word. Their problem is Jesus being the word. Growing, if Jews know their history and they're honest to their sources, they'll admit, yes, yes, the Memra, yes, yes, the Var, yes, yes, Logos in Greek. Yes, Jehovah's word that the rabbis saw as a personal messenger distinct from God, sent by God, Authorized by God, who is called God, worshipped as God, calls himself God. Yeah, we see that. We know that. Where they deny is that word becoming Jesus. In other words, historically, this is a fact. Don't take my word for it. Historians will admit this. Historically, when John wrote, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. 
Jews would have amended it. Jews at the time of John knew this because we have sources before John like Philo of Alexandria, an Alexandrian Jew writing in Greek. He mentions the Logos, the word, and he calls him the second God. He's not created, but he's not uncreated in that he proceeds from God. He called him the high priest on God's throne, the chief of all angels, and called him the second God. Philo, a Jew, knew this. The Targums knew this. Okay. So the Jews would have amen John. You know where they would have had a problem with John? You know where they would have had a problem with John? When he says the word became flesh. They'll say, wait, 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 wait. Wait, wait. John, we're with you up until this point. The word was with God. Yeah. He was there before creation. Yes. The word was God. Yeah, because he's also God in essence because he proceeds from God. And yes, the word was used to create all things. Yes, yes. And he gives illumination. Hey, amen. But he became flesh. What are you saying? The word became a human being. Who, John? Jesus of Nazareth. What? That's where they would have been shocked. Yeah, Targums. Targumim. That's actually Aramaic. Tergem. You speak Assyrian? Tergem means interpret. And here... Our friend closed on Sunday, posted the Targum to Isaiah 6, 8. Here it is. He posted it. Here, let me repost it. Here it is. Isaiah 6, 8 from the Targums. And I heard the voice of the word of the Lord. <whistles> the Aramaic translation of Isaiah 6, 8. Translated by Jews in Aramaic who are not Christians. Notice they admitted that was the word's voice that spoke. I heard the voice of the word of the Lord, which said, Whom shall I send to prophesy and who will go to teach? Then said I, Here am I, send me. Yes, Hafsa Edasa. They have no problem with the word. They have the problem with the word becoming Jesus. Yes, now... We know that the Aramaic Targums are older than that too, Protestant believer. There were Targum, Aramaic paraphrases even before Christ as evidenced even by the Dead Sea Scrolls. No, why would the word be speaking to the Holy Spirit medic? I'm about to smash you. Let's try this again. Isaiah 6, 8 from the Old Testament. Let's try this again, medic. Where do you see he was speaking to the Holy Spirit? Let's try it again and read. Who was he talking to? Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. If you mean, if you mean that when the word is speaking and saying, Who go for us, who the us happen to be, if that's what you mean, the Father and the Spirit. But who is he addressing this to? Isaiah. He knows when he says this, Isaiah is going to respond. It's the commissioning of Isaiah by Jesus. But if you mean, who is the us? Yes, it's the word speaking on behalf of the Father and the Spirit. Why? Because the Spirit is the one who's going to transmit the words of Jesus to Isaiah, enabling him to take in those words, to see the vision, and then proclaim the words in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's how they work. Are you with me there? Okay, not to lose the point. Not to lose the point. Isaiah 6, 8. The voice of Jehovah speaks, meaning the voice of Jehovah is a person. The voice of Jehovah speaks, meaning the voice of Jehovah is a person, not simply God's audible sound, audible voice. It is a person that speaks for Jehovah. That's why it says, I heard the voice of Adonai saying. Now, that is a very long way of simply saying, I heard the Lord saying. Why didn't he just say, I heard the Lord saying? Wouldn't that have been easier? I heard Adonai saying. Wouldn't that have been easier? Why make it complicated and say, I heard the voice of Adonai saying. 
because Isaiah is aware, as the Old Testament prophets were aware, this voice is not simply the Father's audible sound. This voice is that agent, that member of the Godhead, called the Word, who also is called the angel, that's distinct from God, whom God sends to communicate God's words to his servants. And this isn't the only time the voice of God appeared and spoke. Remember Genesis 3.8? The King James captures it perfectly. Other translations drop the ball. It says, they heard the voice of Jehovah walking. Jehovah's voice walks, and they heard the voice walking? Genesis 3, verse 8, same Hebrew word, kol. And they heard the voice of Jehovah God walking. Wait, last time I checked, voices don't walk. Last time I checked, voices don't walk. That's why your modern translations will rob you of the import of the word by saying they heard the sound of Jehovah God walking. Why not simply say they heard Jehovah walking if all they meant was they heard God's feet? The King James captured it perfectly. They heard the voice walking. So Jehovah God's voice walked in the garden. Jehovah God's voice appeared in the garden as God when Adam and Eve sinned. And guess how the Targums interpreted, folks? The Aramaic paraphrase of Genesis says that was the word of God they heard walking. Is it sinking in? I have an article on this, by the way. Let me get you the link. I wrote an article refuting the assertion that here, in Genesis 3, it should be rendered as, I heard the sound of Jehovah God walking. No, they heard the voice of Jehovah God walking. And I quote the Targum to show that they even realized the voice there wasn't simply God's audible sound. Or simply the sound of his feet they heard. But it was actually the word of Jehovah, who's the angel of Jehovah, distinct from Jehovah, who's called the voice because he's the one who speaks on Jehovah's behalf. Similarly to what God says about Aaron. To prove to you that the voice of Jehovah in these passages, I'm not saying everywhere, in these passages, is referring to that one, that person in the Godhead. That speaks on God's behalf. I'm going to give you something similar in the Bible. Are you ready for a similar point? Where a human being, a distinct human being, is said to be the mouthpiece of another human being. Why? Because that human being will be speaking on behalf of the other human being. Exodus 4, 16. Exodus 4, verse 16. I'm covering a lot of ground here. A lot of stuff that you guys need to absorb, you need to remember, you need to recall, you need to live out, you need to proclaim. So others here. Exodus 4.16. And he shall, God speaking to Moses about Aaron. Pay attention. God says to Moses, Moses, I got a speech impediment. God says, your brother Aaron's coming to meet you. Speaking about Aaron, guys, listen to Exodus 4.16. Speaking about Aaron, God says to Moses, and he, Aaron, shall be thy spokesman unto the people. He shall be, even he shall be to thee instead of a mouth. And thou shalt be to him instead of God. He'll be your mouth and you'll be his God. Was Aaron literally his mouth? God says, Aaron will be as your mouth and you'll be as his God. So here you can have an actual person functioning as the mouthpiece of another, as the mouth of another, without literally being his mouth, like the voice of Jehovah is not Jehovah's audible speech, audible sound, but that person who represents God speaks on behalf of God. So in that sense, he's called the voice of God. Okay. In fact, let's see how the Jehovah Witness translates Exodus 4.16. Exodus 4.16, Jehovah Witness Bible, if you don't mind. Let me get you the article. 
I got to wrap things up. Let me get it for you. Let's see if I can find the Genesis 3.8. Hold on, guys. I'm trying to find it. Oh, my goodness. Uh, yep. Let me see. Here it goes. Here's the article, part one. It's a two-part article. Let's see how the Job Witness renders it. Here's the Job Witness translation. He will speak for you to the people. and He will be your spokesman. And you'll serve as God to him. What a butchering of the text. Can you get me the ESV? Here's part one of that article on Genesis 3.8, where I prove the voice is a person, not simply the audible sound of God's feet, but an actual person whom they heard walking. The voice himself was the one walking. Okay. He shall speak for you to his people, and he shall be your mouth, and you shall be as God to him. Beautiful. You see? He shall be your mouth. And you shall be as God to him. Now, guys, would anyone seriously believe that Aaron was literally Moses' mouth? Here's the link again to Genesis 3 at part 1. And at the bottom, I give you the link to part 2. So why would Aaron be called his mouth? Because he speaks on his behalf. So then why would this distinct person in the Godhead be called the voice of Jehovah? Because he speaks on Jehovah's behalf. Why would he be called the word of Jehovah? Because he's the one who communicates God's words to us. So why would he be called the angel of Jehovah? Because angel in Hebrew means messenger, and a messenger is sent to relay a message. So the voice of God, the word of God, and angel of God all mean the same thing in reference to Jesus. Are you guys getting blown away with all this meat? And you know where you need to glorify God and get on your knees and praise him day and night? Ryan, do not ask me the same question over again. I'm going to block you. Let me finish my point. I know you think your question is more important than what I'm talking about. Okay. Stop doing this. Brethren, for the love of Christ, when you see I'm talking a point, don't keep asking me a question over and over again because you haven't even let me finish the point. Sorry, Ryan, but these are the rules. Be patient. I can only cover so many topics at one time. Be patient. It's okay, Ryan. I love you, brother. And I want you to benefit and be blessed. But follow the rules. Help me to help you. Because you keep repeating the same thing. What about God wrestling with Jacob? I wrote an article on it, Ryan. The God that wrestled with Jacob was Jesus Christ in his pre existence. Because in Hosea chapter 12, verses 2 to 5, we're told specifically that the Jehovah God that wrestled with Jacob was the angel of God. And that angel becomes Jesus Christ. I'll get to it and I'll give you the link to my article. I promise you. Okay. Okay. So now again, let me make this point again. The word, the titles, voice of Jehovah. Word of Jehovah, or voice of God, word of God, and angel of Jehovah, angel of God, all mean the same thing. The person is called the voice of God because he speaks on God's behalf. He's called the word of God because he communicates God's words to his servants. He's called the angel of God because the Hebrew word for angel means messenger, and a messenger is one who relays a message. So these are three titles that are telling us the same thing about Jesus. He is the voice, the word, and the angel. Because he, in the Godhead, is the one who speaks on the Father's behalf, <clears throat> represents the Father, relays the Father's message and his words to us in union with the Holy Spirit. Now, folks, you know I got to get on your knees and praise the triumph God and keep bathing me in prayer? All of this information I'm giving to you is on the spot. The Spirit is so amazing, so glorious, so majestic, may He be glorified, that He has enabled and empowered me to be able to recall information at the moment without any notes, because that's how amazing the Holy Spirit of the Father and Son happens to be. All glory to our God. I'm even blown away that I'm able to just do this, because I'm telling you it's not me. It has nothing to do with me. I'm a maggot. It's all him because he's real and he's our life. Save us for your glory. We love you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. 
right? That's why these attacks are vicious. The enemy wants to take me out. But I'm shielded by the blood of Jesus and surrounded with a wall of fire from the Holy Spirit, my daughters and I, in Jesus' name. Okay. Did we get all this so far? You saw in Isaiah 6, 8, why the plural? And I heard the voice of Adonai saying, the voice is speaking, whom shall I send who will go for us? You see why it's singular and plural? Because the voice is speaking singularly, but then he's speaking on behalf of the Godhead. I will send for us. Thank you. Shamati. Shamati et kol Adonai. Yes, please, guys, join Vine and fasting for me. In fact, Tuesday evening to Wednesday, because that's the big court date that I will not have her hold me in contempt so I can stay here and God fights this financial burden. Medic, I actually prayed for here. Let me tell you what I prayed for so we can keep on topic. I was influenced by charismatics to pray for the gift of tongues. Because they said that's a sign you're spirit filled. So I would pray for the gift of tongues and pray and never got it. And then as I started teaching, I realized that the Holy Spirit enabled me to recall scriptures from memory by his power without prior preparation or notes. And early on, I realized that was his gifting. Praise his name because the Holy Spirit chooses what gifts to give to whom. You can ask for a gift. But he may have other gifts in mind and not the one that you're asking in particular. That's 1 Corinthians 12, verse 11. It says, the Holy Spirit, one and the same Spirit, distributes these gifts individually according to his will, not yours. Hey, Brad, I know you are a filthy rabby dog and you're upset that you don't know who your father is. But blame your mother, not us, you, you filthy scum of Satan. Sorry, guys. I'm direct in your face. Okay. You with me there? There's 1 Corinthians 12, 11. It's right there. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. It's not your choice. You can ask for a gift, but the Holy Spirit will say, that's not the gift I have for you. I have this for you. And he empowers you to use it. Thank you, CP Suckling Drive. Drive through. May God bless you and every one of you. Now, if we got all this, why don't we go to Isaiah 6 8? Let's go back to Isaiah 30 30. Isaiah 30 30. And to be honest with you, I'd rather have this gift than in speaking in tongues because this gift is being used by the Spirit to shake, rock, transform, and blow minds away for the glory of God. And that's what Paul said. Paul said, I'd rather speak five words clearly to edify than 10,000 words in a tongue that no one understands. Okay? Isaiah 30, 30. Notice the connection with his voice and his arm. Notice the connection with his voice and his arm. Yes, Muhammad bin Numan. If you guys fast me, I'd appreciate it for a miracle. Isaiah 30, 30. And the Lord will cause his majestic voice to be heard and the descending blow of his arm to be seen. Notice the hearing of the voice and the seeing of the arm. Because when Jesus is revealed, that's the voice of God being heard and the arm of God being seen in the flesh. Uh, I'll, I'll mention that at the end, Bill Thompson, because I don't want to go off topic yet before I conclude. Everyone with me? You caught it? Did you see Isaiah 30, 30? The glorious voice of Jehovah will be heard, and the blowing of his arm shall be seen. That took place when Jesus became human, because then they heard the voice of God and seen his arm in the flesh. Because God's voice is his arm, his arm is his voice. Isaiah 30, 30. Did you see it? Now let's go to Isaiah 52, 10. Isaiah 52, 10. We're focusing on the arm and connecting with Jesus. Exactly, King of Kings. He knows what's best for you. Okay. The, the Lord Jehovah has bared his holy arm. He's bared it so you can see it. 
before the eyes of all the nations. And all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Do you make the connection again? When God's holy arm is revealed, they will see the salvation of God to the ends of the earth. Do you see the connection with his arm and salvation? His arm and judgment. His arm and salvation. His arm and judgment. you see it? And it's not a coincidence. Isaiah 52, 10 is right before Isaiah 52, verse 13 to Isaiah 53, 12. Isaiah 52, 10 is right there in the context of Isaiah 52, 13. The servant who was lifted high, exalted, right? Who's then identified as the arm in Isaiah 53, verse 1. You with me there? Focus, guys. You focusing? Isaiah 52, 10, bearing his holy arm and bringing salvation, dovetails into Isaiah 52, verse 13, to Isaiah 53, 12, which is all about the servant of Jehovah bringing God's salvation, redemption, justification, atonement for sin. And that's the same Isaiah 53, verses 1 to 2, where he's said to be the arm of Jehovah who is revealed, there it is, verse 1, who grows up before Jehovah. Do you see that the servant is the arm of Jehovah? The arm of Jehovah is the servant. Are you seeing it? Do I need to quote Isaiah 53, verses 1 to 2 again? Now notice why am focusing on tongues. Oh, the Billah. Whew. Everyone see it? That in Isaiah 53, the servant is the arm of Jehovah. The servant is the arm of Jehovah. You saw that, right? I don't need to prove it. And you saw that the arm of Jehovah is connected with the glorious voice of Jehovah. And then we saw in Isaiah 6, 8, the voice of Jehovah saying and commissioning and speaking on behalf of the us. Everyone saw that? Because when you go on tangents into other issues, I don't know if you're following me. Okay. It's going to get a little better. So I'm almost done. Isaiah 62 verse 8. Almost done. We're going to go out with a bang because I'm going to be done with Isaiah. Isaiah 62, verse 8. Notice the repeated references to the arm of Jehovah, the arm of Jehovah, the arm of Jehovah. Jehovah has sworn by his right hand and by his mighty arm. I will not again give your grain to be food for your enemies, and foreigners shall not drink your wine for which you have labored. Is it a coincidence? Jesus sits at the right hand of God. Obviously, Jesus is not literally the arm of Jehovah because Jehovah is not a physical being. It's a metaphor. And yet we have Jesus at God's right hand because he is the right arm of Jehovah who is revealed in the flesh to bring salvation. The one who is mighty. Do you remember in Isaiah 9, 6? He's the mighty God. So he is the right hand and the mighty arm of Jehovah, the mighty God who was born as a child. Do you catch it? Right hand, mighty arm. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, and he's the mighty God who's born as a child. Is it cat sinking in? Come on now. Sinking in? Angela, you can go back and listen to the session, so... Sinking in, right hand, mighty arm, child born, mighty God. Jesus sits at the right hand of God. Psalm 1101, Yehovah said to Adon, my Adon, Ladoni, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. I'm going to go out with a bang because this is it. Two parts on Isaiah, I'm done. You with me? You catching it? Sink it in? 
You catching it? Sinking in? Okay. Let me show you Isaiah praying to Jehovah's arm and Jehovah's arm being responsible for saving Israel during the Exodus. Isaiah 51, verses 9 to 10. We're, all, we're almost done. We're going to go out with a bang. Isaiah 51, verses 9 to 10. You're going to see what bang we're going to go out with to blow you away. Isaiah 51, verses 9 to 10. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of Jehovah. Awake. This is an invocation. Isaiah is crying out, invoking the arm of Jehovah to awaken, to do something, awaken to action. Why is Isaiah praying to the arm? Awake, awake, o, put on strength, O arm of Jehovah. Awake, as in the ancient days, as you did in the past, in the generation of old. Art thou not? He's speaking to the arm. He's praying to the arm, and he's talking to the arm. Art thou not? It that hath cut Rahab, Rahab is a monster that represents evil, specifically Satan. And wounded the dragon, you arm are the one that cut Rahab and wounded the dragon. Sure sounds like Jesus is destroying Satan because dragon is a symbol of Satan. And he's praying to the arm, awake arm, put on strength arm like you did in the past when you cut Rahab and wounded the dragon. You're that one. We need you. Why is Isaiah? praying to the arm of Jehovah. But then notice the arm of Jehovah was active at the time of Moses because notice verse 10. Art thou not it? Were you not the one which dried the sea, the Red Sea at the time of Moses, the waters of the great deep that hath made the depths of the sea a way for the ransom to pass over? Wait, Jehovah's arm dried the Red Sea? In order to save the ransom of God, Israel, Jehovah's arm is the one who cut Rahab and wounded the dragon. He did it. And now Isaiah is praying to the arm, awake like you did in the past. Put on strength to come and save us. Why is he praying to the arm? But ah. I'm going to show you the Trinity. Jehovah has two arms. One is the servant, Messiah, Jesus. The other is the Holy Spirit. Isaiah 51, 5. Yep, exactly, Sarah laughs. That's angel Jehovah. Jehovah has two arms. Jesus, the servant, and the Holy Spirit. Isaiah 51, 5. Watch here. Don't believe me. My righteousness is near. My salvation is going forth. Mine arms shall judge the people. The isles shall wait upon me, and mine own arm shall they trust. I have two arms to save. One is the servant. He becomes man, and he dies to save us. Who's the other arm? Who's the other arm? Go to Isaiah 63, 14. Who's the other arm? Arms, two, not one. Who's the other arm? Watch here. Watch. Isaiah 63, 14. As a beast go down into the valley, the spirit of Jehovah caused him to rest. Speaking of the time of Moses and the Exodus, Jehovah's spirit gave the people rest. So didst thou lead thy people to make thyself a glorious name. Wait. The Holy Spirit gives rest and saves, and the servant of Jehovah brings salvation and rest. No wonder Jehovah has arms. Arms. Oh, but let me give you the context of Isaiah 63. You ready for the context? You want to see the context so you get really blown away? Of Isaiah 63? I mentioned this in a previous session. I have to repeat it again. Okay. Now we're going to read the context and really get blown away. Count, guys. Don't even text now. Just pay attention and count. Let's do some math. Renee, good to see you, sister. Renee. Isaiah 63, 7 to 16. Wait, 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 wait. This ain't nothing yet. Woo! Wait, baby. Mom, it ain't nothing yet, man. I am sure you think it's going to blow you away? <laughs> Wait, I ain't even there yet for the boom, boom. Let's read Isaiah 63, 63, 7 to 16. Count how many. 
I will mention the loving kindnesses of Jehovah and the praises of Jehovah, according to all that Jehovah hath bestowed on us and the great goodness toward the house of Israel, which he hath bestowed on them, according to his mercies, according to the multitude of his loving kindnesses. For he said, surely they are my people, children that will not lie. So he was their savior. Count, count now, start counting. In all their affliction, he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. So Jehovah's angel, who beholds his face, because presence is face, and who embodies his face, saved them. Hmm. The angel saved them in his love and in his pity. He redeemed them and bare them and carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. Hmm. They grieved his Holy Spirit. So his spirit has emotion showing he's a person. Angel and spirit. His Holy Spirit. Hmm. Wow. Oh, but wait, wait, wait. Therefore, he was turned to be their enemy and he fought against them. Then he remembered the days of old, Moses and his people saying, Where is he that brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock, Moses? Where is he that put his Holy Spirit within him? Oh, wow. So the Holy Spirit was there active. In and through Moses. Uh, but now notice 12. That led them by the right hand of Moses with his glorious arm. There's the arm again. Dividing the water before them. There's that arm that dried the, ground, the, the, the Red Sea to make himself an everlasting lame, uh, name. That led them through the deep as a horse in the wilderness that they should not stumble. As a beast goeth down into the valley of the Spirit of Jehovah. Gave them rest. As a beast goeth down into the valley, the spirit of Jehovah caused them to rest. So didst thou lead thy people to make thyself a glorious name. But now let's read 15 and 16 before the rapture. 15 and 16. I still have two fingers out. Don't leave us behind now. Look down from heaven and behold from the habitation of thy holiness. And of thy glory, where, thy, where is thy zeal and thy strength, the sounding of thy bowels and of thy mercies towards me? And here's the knockout and then the knockout to come afterwards. 16. Watch here. Doubtless thou art our father. Oh, wow. Jehovah, our father, the angel of Jehovah, the father, the Holy Spirit of Jehovah, our father. Though Abraham... Be ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledge, acknowledge us not. Thou, O Jehovah, art our Father, our Redeemer. Thy name is from everlasting. Is it a coincidence three and only three? Jehovah, who is the Father of his people, the angel of his presence, and the Holy Spirit. Okay. Isaiah 63, 1 to 6. That's right. I'm going to put on music before I end it. Vine, you there? Is it blowing you away, Vine? Isaiah 63, verses 1 to 6. Watch here. Here's where, again, I want you guys not to text and focus. Tell me how Jehovah looks. Who is this that cometh from Edom? The dyed garments from Basra. So he comes from Syria. So here's a figure in a garment that's dyed. A garment that's dyed. Well, let's see who this figure is. Pay attention. Let's see who this figure is. This that is glorious in his apparel, in his clothing, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness mighty to save. Now watch. Pay attention. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel? Why is your apparel, your robe, red? Why is it red? Thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat, a wine press. That a wine press is where you have grapes, and you then you stomp on the grapes to get the juice to make wine. So the wine press, wine fat, is when you stomp on grapes. So if you have a garment and you're stomping on grapes, it's going to stain, stain your garments. So why is it that your clothes look like? You've been treading the wine fat, the wine press. Notice the response. I have trodden the wine press alone. Guys, pay attention to the word alone. I tread the wine press alone. No one did it with me or for me. And of the people, there was none with me. 
for I will tread them in my anger and trample them in my fury. And their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garment. And I will stain all my raiment. So he explains why his raiment, his clothing is red. This, it's red because I am stomping on my enemies like grapes under my feet in a wine press. And it's their blood that's spattered on me. Very graphic and violent imagery. I am squashing them like grapes and it's their blood staining my raiment. And God said, I'm doing it alone. Don't forget. He says, alone, no one's with me. Four to six. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed has come. And I will, and I looked, and there was none to help. And I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore, mine own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury it upheld me. And I will tread down the people of mine anger, and make them drunk in my fury. And I will bring down their strength to the earth. Now watch. Jehovah says, I alone did it. You guys got to pay attention. No one helped me. No one did this. I stopped, trampled my enemies as grapes in a wine press under my feet, and my garment is stained with their blood, which is why it's red. I did it alone. My garments are red because I tread the wine press of my anger alone. Did you get that part? He did it alone. He tread the wine press. It's the blood of his enemies splattered on his garment that turned it red, and he did it alone. Now you got to listen. Some of you got it. You know where I'm going with this. Listen, Vine, listen. Revelation 19, verses 11 to 16. I think Solomon, per se, it really wants to disrespect and dishonor me. He keeps harping on tongues with Andrew, and he doesn't drop it. And he's a Christian. Okay? Revelation 19, 11 to 16. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. Pay attention. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. His apparel was dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. So this is Jesus, the Word of God, not the Father, the Word of God. That's his name. That's Jesus. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he, the Word of God, Jesus, treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. How is that possible? How is that possible? Jesus, the word of God, not the Father, tread on the winepress of the wrath of Almighty God. Jesus' garment is stained with the blood of his enemies that he has stomped under his feet like grapes in a winepress. But we just read... Isaiah 63 and Jehovah said, I did it alone. No one did it with me or for me. I did it alone. I did it alone. I'm not even sink in because we're done. You caught it? Did it sink in? Revelation 19, 13 says his name is the word of God, Alex. So you can't say it's the father. So why is Jesus dressed like and why is Jesus doing what Isaiah 63 verses 1 to 6 states plainly, Jehovah alone is dressed in and Jehovah alone does? Because Jesus is the arm of Jehovah. He's the voice of Jehovah. He's the word of Jehovah, the messenger of Jehovah, who sits on the throne of Jehovah, who appears as Jehovah to Isaiah with the Father and the Spirit. Now you see why John 12, 37 to 41, John 12, 37 to 41, John said, 
quoting Isaiah 53, verse 1, where the servants called the arm of Jehovah revealed, and then quoting Isaiah 6, 10, when he quotes those passages, he said, Isaiah wrote about him, Jesus, because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Do you see why John could say that Isaiah, when he saw Jehovah on the throne, appearing to him visibly in his glory on the throne, there was Jesus appearing to him as Jehovah, because to be the voice of Jehovah means he's one with Jehovah, so he's the one appearing with Jehovah visibly. And that's why he could then connect that passage, Isaiah 6, with Isaiah 53, 1, verse, verses 1 and 2, because there the servant who's called the arm of Jehovah does what only Jehovah does, which no one else can do, and is exalted to the throne of Jehovah because he's the voice of Jehovah, the arm of Jehovah, the word of Jehovah, the messenger of Jehovah, who sits with the Father on the throne with the Spirit because altogether they're the one Jehovah God. John saw it. Paul saw it. And by the grace of the triune God, all of us are seeing it now. Now for your cake. John 12, 37. For your cake and you can eat it too. John 12, 37. You must re listen to this session with part one which I did two days ago. You have to listen to both se sessions together, prayerfully, slowly, and ask the Spirit to help you absorb it and then share it with others. Here is your cake, and we're going to eat cake and celebrate. John 12, 37. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. Who did the miracles in John 12 here? Who is John talking about? Who is John talking? Who did miracles that the Jews didn't believe in John 12? Jesus, right? Okay. Now do me a favor, Protestant. Post John 12, 37, back to back with Numbers 14, 11. John 12, 37, back to back with Numbers 14, 11. Let's see if you guys catch it and go out with a bang. Read with me. But though he, Jesus, had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. Now notice what Jehovah says. And Jehovah said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? How long will it be ere they believe me for all the signs which I have showed among them? Wow. Like Israel did at the time of Moses, when Jehovah did signs they didn't believe, again, Israel refused to believe the miracles that Jehovah was doing in their presence as a man called Jesus of Nazareth, how history repeats itself. Wow. You didn't get it? Did you get it? Read it again. John 12, 37. But though Jesus, he had done so many miracle signs before them, yet they believed not on him. Notice Numbers 14, 11, when Jehovah says to Moses, complaining. And Jehovah said unto Moses, how long will this people provoke me? How long will it be here, meaning they will not believe me, for all the signs which I have showed among them? So even though Jehovah had done many signs and miracles at the time of Moses, they still didn't believe. And history repeats itself. Because here was Jehovah again in the flesh doing miracles again to the descendants of those Jews. And like their ancestors before them, they still didn't believe in the signs of Jehovah again. There is physical Israel and spiritual Israel. If you belong to Christ, you are spiritual Israel. But there's still physical Israel and still promises that Jesus will fulfill in honor of the patriarchs. But that's not really related to the topic. Are you getting the point now? Did you catch your cake? Did you eat it? Numbers 14, 11. How long will these people provoke, provoke me? How long will they continue not to believe in me in spite of all the miracles I did? Jehovah at the time of Moses. Here's Jehovah again in the flesh, the one Isaiah saw on the throne. And though Jesus, as Jehovah in the flesh, did many signs, they still did not believe in him, continuing in the footsteps of their ancestors, adding to their sins. Nothing new under the sun. History repeats itself. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Jehovah, God in the flesh. 
one with the Father and the Holy Spirit, the one triune God of all who lives, mighty to save, who is reality, who loves us, in love with us. And we pray that you give us the power to be in love with you, to live for you, and to die for you. And Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, save us from the world. Save us from Satan. Save us from our own flesh. Save me, Lord. Please, Lord, I need a miracle. This debt I cannot pay and will not pay because it's the money of God that they want to rob from me. Show up, my God, for your glory because I am your servant, your child this Wednesday. And save my daughters and I bring them to me and plant me here securely and provide for me. And Lord, continue to make me holy, to be more like Jesus, and help me to get healthier and to die to my flesh. And bless everyone here. Bless them with holiness and health and wisdom from your spirit to fall in love with your word so we can fall in love with you. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, pray. Wednesday's a big day. If this witch holds me in contempt of court for a legal debt that's not mine, then they can come after me. Pray I stay here. No one comes after me because it's not my debt. Rebuke it in Jesus' name. And pray for my girls. Just by way of confession, yesterday I saw their pictures. And as I held their pictures, I was crying because I ache for them. I love my girls. And they love their Baba. And we need Jesus to bring us together. So pre keep praying. Love you guys. I'll try to do another show tomorrow, Monday. But Lord willing, I'm going to be traveling with David Wood on Tuesday. And won't be back till Friday. If I can live stream there. I will, but pray for mercy here. They accepted me here. Pray their hearts turn favorably towards me to keep me here. And they'll work with me for the glory of Christ. Okay? Christ is risen, risen indeed. Love you guys. Take care.